Everything is Better with Creators is proud to be part of the Adweek Podcast Network and Acast Creator Network. What is the creator economy and why should you care? And how does a small town girl from Massachusetts start consulting for major brands like Chips Ahoy and Burger King and also have a segment on E! News all within one year? Well, for one thing, she thought outside the box and made her own opportunities, all thanks to the power of TikTok. So who is this girl that went from waitress to marketing consigliere overnight? It's none other than Robin Del Monte, AKA Girl Boss Town. And today we're speaking to this marketing guru live from our Everything is Better with Creators podcast studio at Brand Week Miami. This time last year, Robin was a waitress during the day and the internet's agent at night. Robin's dream job was to become a creative director and marketing strategist for her favorite celebrities and brands. So what does she do? She creates TikTok videos for her favorite celebrities, brands, and pitches them her PR moves and gives away strategy consultations for free. And you can believe this, everything included commercial concepts, design ideas for editorial campaigns, and fully baked brand and creator collaboration campaign ideas. Robin went viral when she gave singer Madison Beer a PR makeover. After that, all of her favorite celebrities and brands started sliding into her DMs asking for her marketing advice. Now, one year later, Robin has amassed a massive following with over half a million followers and 63 million likes on TikTok. She's working with brands, she's on all of our favorite podcasts, and soon you'll see her hosting and interviewing celebrities on the red carpet. Welcome to this episode of Everything is Better with Creators. I'm Jamie Goodfriend, your guide to all things happening in the creator economy. Everything is Better with Creators, the podcast that takes a deep dive into all things creator economy. Produced and presented by Whaler. Whaler, we power the creator economy. With your hosts, Ashley Rudder, Emma Harmon, Jamie Goodfriend, and Marco Batosi. Good morning. I am so excited to say that I'm here with the amazing Robin Del Monte, otherwise known as Girl Boss Town. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. My favorite thing to do is to talk to people. So this is my bread and butter. I'm really excited to be speaking with you. Well, you were going to be talking to a lot of people. Our audience is brands, uh, agencies, mm. creators, people who are creator curious. So mm. who better than to talk to Girl Boss Town? Now, I have a, a admission to make. I'm a fangirl. I saw your TikToks, I don't know, eight months ago mm -hmm. and been obsessed. And when I heard that you were going to be here, I was so happy to actually meet you. But let's let's start from the beginning. Girl Boss Town, uh, it, it started as a podcast, but how do you explain to your friends and family what you do for a living? That's a really great question. And when I've been asked a couple times this weekend, which has helped me to try to curate a better answer, um, even with my dating profiles, yes, I'm single, when people ask what I do, I never know what to say. Um, but how I would, the best way to put it now is I would say that I am a creative consultant and the ultimate pop culture consumer and I take all of my knowledge from being a consumer, from being obsessed with pop culture and mix that with business marketing and branding to come up with PR moves, creative direction ideas, commercial ideas for the brands and celebrities that I love. Um, I feel like I have two arms to my career. One arm is forward facing, doing traditional brand deals, doing hosting, doing events like this. And then the other arm is on the back end, which is really building out a successful consulting career and starting to work with brands on the creative side to kind of be a sponge and absorb everything that I can to learn about this industry so that in the future when I want to take on um, a more specific role, I'll know exactly what I want to do. And for brands, when you say you, you want to consult, mm -hmm. I can imagine that that can be feeling a little bit threatening to existing mm -hmm. organizations. Yes. 
How do you work with an existing marketing team and an internal? Is it an agency at a brand direct? How yeah. Do you do that? So, for example, one of the first brands that allowed me to really take the reins on a project was a brand called Bliss, which is a skincare company. Um, and they allowed me from start to finish to um, creative direct a TikTok campaign. Um, I was able to pick the talent. I was able to uh, create the ideas for each talent. I don't say scripts because I let them kind of allow their own creativity and authenticity to come through. Um, and then I showed that entire process on my TikTok, which was incredible. But I feel like being a creator myself, I know how to speak to creators. But then on the business side, I know what the businesses want. Um, rather than just being in a boardroom and sitting and looking around and being like, okay, what do we think this, these creators want to do? Like, what do we think is appealing to creators? What do we think people on TikTok want to see? Tapping native creators to be a part of that process is something that I've been pushing and wanting out of my career and I think has been extremely successful so far. So it can be intimidating or like for other marketing agencies or brands with massive marketing teams to be like, well, why would we let this person in? But I think collaboration is massive especially with how fast things change mm -hmm. in this industry so to <clears throat> work with somebody who has their finger on the pulse and is on these apps every single day can only benefit them rather than hurt them that real-time nature is the challenge for brands mm -hmm. it's it's <clears throat> moving at the speed of culture is not what they were designed for no and it is really important to be able to have somebody who is following things on a minute by minute. It's like up to the nanosecond. Yeah, and I think something that's super important that I always try to speak with brands about is when to use your resources, when to use your marketing teams, and when to use people like me who are native creators who know what these trends are. I feel like brands get confused because they're like, okay, so we need to do what's trendy. So they'll take their marketing budget and put it behind a video that is an existing trend, but by the time the video comes out, the trend is gone. Right. When instead, <clears throat> they could hop on the trend without their marketing budget, do it in-house, do it super quickly as that trend is going on, and that could get more views than a campaign that you spend X amount of money on. But then there's certain campaigns that you should spend X amount of money on that will have longevity and that will always spark creativity or last in this industry that aren't trendy. And I feel like brands are kind of trying to figure that out now and some of them are doing it great and some of them aren't. So it's like no one to spend the money in the resources on building out a traditional ad campaign and knowing when to tap your team to just go off of certain trends that you can make in-house for no money and get the same amount of views. All right, so let's break that down a little bit. The, yeah. the real-time speed of culture, trend is happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, a couple of months ago, it was, you know, five things I wouldn't do as, or yeah. there's always some new trend. Yeah. I'm a CMO at a brand. I, somebody, my daughter probably comes to me and says, mom, this everybody's trend doing. is happening. Mm -hmm. This is everybody's doing this. I call my, this is typically what happens. I call my marketing team and go, why are we not on TikTok with this trend? So how do you really advise on that? And then how do you advise on actually operationalizing the longer term approach, the evergreen approach? Of course. Um, so before my career on TikTok, I've been doing this for eight months. I know I've been in the industry forever. Um, I was bartending and working at Anthropology. If a brand reached out to me and said, hey, like we want you be to be a part of this process or to be on the team, I would do anything to quit my traditional nine to five to work in creative. There are so many creatives on this app, just like me, who have their finger on the pulse of relevancy, who would die to work for a brand and to be creative. So I think to the approach is to get somebody on your team and to start working with these people who are on these apps 24 seven, I don't know if that's like from an intern standpoint, from like actually having somebody join the social team who doesn't have a traditional background, um, and to really tap the, those minds and those creatives who would love to do this instead of training somebody on how to do it, I think is smart. And then for the long-term approach, I think it's as well, really what I think about for long-term ads and ads that you put money in in Evergreen is, what would make me stop scrolling? As simple as that. Mm -hmm. I'm an advertising nerd, so like when I'm in New York, I'm just looking up, which is probably not smart, nobody robbed me. Um, but I just always, what is something that makes you stop and think? What is something that evokes emotion? 
Um, what is something that makes you stop and scroll? A lot of people say it's a saturated industry. I don't necessarily believe that. But what are the ads that make you feel and like really as a creative stop and be like, this is incredible. I love this. And you know those ad ad campaigns take time and effort and energy and there's so much storytelling behind it mm -hmm. rather than following a trend that is kind of already has the story behind it because it's just a trend that you're following and the evergreen ads it's like how do we want to tell this story instead of hopping on a trend what is our voice going to sound like in this rather than making your voice fit into a trend that is currently already happening okay so let's talk about a couple brands that um who do you who would you can list as your dream client that you're dying to work for okay or with so I have two dream clients that I would like to work with and then there's two brands that I think are doing incredible things Great. that I want to like tap into um, Uggs and Diet Coke are my two dream brands that I want to work with <laughs> because they're something that I consume and use every single day and they have been since I was like eight years old even though my mom couldn't afford actual Uggs I was wearing bear claws but now that I have my own payment I wear Uggs um, and those are just two brands that are like my fangirl brands things that I genuinely love and use every single day um, so we'll put that message out we're gonna manifest yeah, that manifest we're manifesting that, that right 100%. now out into the universe and then two brands that I'm obsessed with and I love one of them is gonna be here and I'm trying to meet up with um, the person who's gonna be representing them here and then one of them is my dear friend's brand, um, Vacation, who is going to be here. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. They are a, like, sunscreen. Um, they started as a sunscreen, and now they're expanding into, like, scents and lotions. Their whole marketing campaign is very 80s beach club vibe. Their, adverti their advertisements feel so, so nostalgic, yet modern at the same time. Their copy is incredible. Their website is insane. And they're, I just like geek out over them. I love them so much. So definitely check out Vacation. They're one of a kind. Everything that they do, they just came out with sunscreen that looks like whipped cream. But the, the branding of it is like so 80s. Just, I'm obsessed with it. And the guy who's going to be Adweek, his name is Latch. I believe that's how you say it. Maybe I was saying it wrong. Um, and then my other favorite brand that I think is so on the pulse of everything, their marketing seems effortless, but there's so much thought behind it, and it just speaks to the voices of the CEOs, which is we're not really strangers. Um, it's a card game that allows you to ask super deep questions, and there's different layers to it, and they have different decks. There's like decks for families, decks for singles, decks for breakups, the actual deck. And... Um, Kareen, who started it, who's my good friend. Now she's my friend. I used to be a fan of her. Um, but they use authentic storytelling through, which is, I think, a buzzword that is overused, but on social media and on an app that seems so not authentic. Um, and it shows real people answering real questions with real emotions. And it is just, it's incredible. You guys should really all check it out. I love their branding. It's just so smart. But you have a different, you have a really interesting perspective because as, as I look at your content, you have a range of topics that you blend together in an asymmetric way. You're clearly an asymmetric thinker. Yes. And you've got everything from grief to PR moves to Kardashians mm -hmm. to your, so you're a little bit of page six, People Magazine. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got a mix. You yeah. clearly are in culture. Yes. But you're able to connect those dots to be able to explain things from the consumer perspective. And I think as you were saying before, for brands to be able to tap into the people who are already fans of their brands mm -hmm. or the communities that they actually want to try to reach. I think that's where the next evolution of 360 creator marketing is going. Yeah. Where you don't just view a creator as someone that can help transactions happen, but help a cultural transformation happen for the brand. Because yes. you're, you're in it. And as you said, it's, you know, we always talk about, you know, it's people sitting around in a boardroom. It's like get the um, creators off your mood boards and into your boardroom. Yes. And have them integrated into your decision making earlier. Yeah. Do, do you find people are open to you coming to them when you have an idea that's off the, you know, normal path of thinking? How do you do that? Um, yes and no. Reddit would say no. Um, but when I've worked with brands, yes. And sometimes when brands are open to that, I know I'm doing something right. Because I feel like all the greatest people in business and the people that I looked up to, people didn't understand their vision at first, which means it's 
they're pioneering a new industry and they're forward thinking. So even when brands aren't necessarily open to like my creative ideas at first, I continue to push that and it almost motivates me more because I'm like, if the industry is saying it's not ready for this right now, that's exactly what the industry needs. Um, but I do think that there are brands and it, ma it makes me so happy. Um, even to talk corporate, I've had conversations and they've tapped me for certain opportunities to work with brands that go to TikTok and are like, hey, we want to get on TikTok. What is, what do we do? You know what I mean? Um, Call Robin. Yeah, exactly. Call Girl West. Like, hello, my DMs are open. Um, but yeah, I think brands are definitely open to it. And I think that when I come to things like Ad Weeks Brand Week or when I'm in meetings and the CMOs and the CEOs are fangirling over me, that means so much more to me than um, just having numbers and having a certain amount of followers to make me feel good. Because it just shows that the people who are running the industry right now see my ideas and respect them. And maybe they might not be able to work with me now, but they can see that this is where the industry is going and they love my voice and my, not my actual voice right now, <laughs> but um, they love what I have to say. And it shows that they're open to it. Even being invited to something like this, it just shows, okay, the industry is hearing me and they're seeing me and it's crawl, walk, run. So I think it's gonna take some time to fully get where I wanna be, but um, I'm off to a great start. You're listening to Everything is Better with Creators Podcast. We'll be right back. We're doing a podcast in the Ad Week Podcast studio, and I'm excited to hear a lot of discussion, just yeah. like in Cannes now here at Brand Week, about how creators are emerging. And I don't think it's a question of if it will become a thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's more about how and when and the measurement and some of the structure built around it. Yeah. But on the other side, for, for people that are listening that are on the creator side, there's not a lot of empathy for brands in the sense that we view them as if you're not in the brand side, if you're on the agency side, if you're a creator, if you are a consumer, you think about the brand a lot of times as a monolithic entity but the people that are making decisions to hire Girl Boss Town have a CFO, a CEO, teams, board members, stock prices to support. And I think part of the next stage of evolution of the creator economy is for creators to have a better understanding of what it takes on the brand side. And there is a lot of fear on the brand side. The average CMO will last less than 18 months. So it's a very scary thing. Uh, to be able to have the confidence to do something that's brave mm -hmm. and it's happening more and more yeah. but how do you how would you counsel somebody who wants to get into this space um, either on the brand side or as a creator trying to help brands well growing up my dad always said you need to spend money to make money which I don't know if I necessarily um, fully agree with but I think in the creative space like you need to take risks to make something great you need to go against the grain <laughs> which is way easier said than done, which is exactly what you just explained. But I feel like the greatest things have come from taking risks and even just me putting myself out on this platform and giving my ideas out there for free, mm -hmm. which a lot of people would probably advise not to, that's where I got where I am today. And I feel like in the creative space, you need to listen to creatives. And a lot of times that's kind of hard to do because we're all over the place. I'm sure you can relate to that as well. Um, but maybe, if you're afraid to fully take the risk, just talk to talk to creators, talk to creators, have meetings like this, speak about things like this to better understand each other before fully taking the risk of maybe adding them onto the team. But it's like, let's both see where we're coming from. Let's both see what we think is missing on either side of this argument, or not argument, but conversation. Um, and I feel like the better you understand the other side of things, the more that you guys could find a way to work together that might feel more safe and rather than like a risk. But you know me, I'm just like, take the risk. Like, give me the reins, like I got this. And they're like, um, okay. But yeah, I think there's a happy medium that can be found within working and hearing out both sides of this conversation. So one of the things that we've recently done and we'll be talking about it is we just um, launched at Whaler, we just launched a creator academy mm -hmm. and we're working with Logitech for creators to Amazing. help do that. And our, our goal is to be able to accelerate starting out creators, people who are 
potentially marginalized, who are not able to have the same kind of opportunities as other people, mm -hmm. diverse voices, and to really give them the background to accelerate their careers. Yeah. You know, that's a, it's an important thing because we really believe in the power of the creator economy, mm -hmm. but we need to make sure that it's robust and people have, you know, they get the skills. There's not like you can go to creator school. Yeah, no. And you learn the hard way. So how, how do you advise or do you advise young creators starting out how they can learn? Like we're, we're talking about everything from legal issues to uh, copyright issues to uh, PR crisis to what kind of equipment to use. Obviously with Logitech, we're going to make sure they have equipment. But what, how do you advise starting out creators to, to get them along their, their path faster? First and foremost, I think there is a massive, massive lack of education about this in the industry. <clears throat> I, um, when I started out, I was able to sign with UTA, which is an incredible, yep. I have an incredible team, and they kind of walked me through certain things like getting a lawyer, um, bank accounts, uh, taxes, all of that, but I had no idea, and I feel like I'm 28 years old, so the fact that there are 16 year olds out there trying to figure this out, maybe in the hands of the wrong type of people, um, it needs to be spoken about more. Um, I think actually an influencer should, their whole platform who has gone through this, I think would a great influencer would be somebody who's educating these types of things. And I always think that there should be classes taught through this at these types of conferences or at like a VidCon or things like that where creators go. But the fact that we are realizing that there's not real, this isn't being spoken about enough, I think is important. Um, but I personally am still learning. So I feel like I wouldn't be able to speak on like, oh, do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. And I also feel like I came from a place of privilege from being with a UTA and my journey kind of came up easier for me than it might for other creators who might not have those types of people in the equation or just came from different backgrounds. Um, so I would love for that question to be asked to somebody whose journey maybe wasn't as um, easy as mine was. Because for me to speak about it, I feel like my is a little wrong because I feel like I had things, um, I had the easy way of figuring out. I don't think it industry. was so easy, but I but I, I do appreciate Okay, but one thing I think you can talk a lot about, and one of the things that brands do not understand about creators is the tax on mental health. Yes. And I find it really interesting. Our, our management team is constantly working with our talent to help make sure that they take care of themselves because it's a grind. And I know it, you guys make it all look easy, but coming up with ideas, managing the changes on the algorithm, it's very taxing, mm -hmm. and I think when brands view creators as actors, it does them a disservice on many levels, creatively, but primarily with their mental health. Yeah. In fact, one of our, our talent team has come up with this approach of using the app Geneva mm -hmm. as a way to connect with fans in a safe way to source ideas and to get feedback in a way that feels community, but they don't feel uh, like it's one more responsibility because nobody's paying. Mm -hmm. No, it's just an exchange and building a community. So yeah. let's talk about the mental health issue for creators. Let's definitely talk about that. Um, when your creativity becomes your career, so much weight is added to it. And as a creative, I feel like I have a lot of imposter syndrome because what I used to just do as my passion for fun now has so much more depth to it, which is a privilege and an amazing thing. But on the other side of it, it's like, it's not as carefree and like just, it doesn't fuel me in the way that it once did. It fuels me now in a way of like, this is my career, I'm able to do this, people are hearing me, this is incredible, this makes me so happy. But then now I'm lacking, like what do I do for fun? Like what is, what is like my, other passion outside of this because now my passion is my career so like what are other things that like fuel my passion and creativity that isn't my career mm -hmm. so I had to learn that one and two just like the mental health of it all I'm extremely blessed to have a team that understands where I'm coming from um I didn't have the best childhood I didn't have the best family situation um growing up which actually I think ended up helping me in the end 
um, as weird as that sounds. Um, no, to, it's resilience. Yeah, to want more out of life. Um, and I ended up losing my mom when I was 20 years old, um, which kind of gave me the perspective to be like, okay, my mom wanted so much out of life and she didn't get to do that. So every second that I'm not doing what I want like is a disservice to her. Um, so mm -hmm. I try to always do what I want. I'm not gonna buy um, 10 Chanel bags because I'm like, this is what I want and this is a disservice to my mom to not buy it. But when it comes to like actually getting what I want out of life and taking opportunities and doing things that people are like, I don't think that's the traditional way, like maybe try this. I just think that like I have to live my life to the fullest. I know that sounds like a TJ Maxx Marshall sign, but it's true. Um, but going through grief, um, depression and anxiety um, while being on a social media platform and being contractually obligated to make content when sometimes I'm not in the headspace to make content is very difficult. Even though I see my career as a privilege, those are the aspects that people don't um, necessarily understand, but I don't blame them for not understanding because before I was in this space, I would look at creators who would speak about mental health and be like, oh, boo-hoo, whatever, like you get to do what you want for a living. So I don't blame people for not understanding it and I don't blame businesses for not understanding it, but now that I'm in the position, position I try to speak about it as much as possible from a place that I don't fear people being like, oh, well, boo-hoo mm -hmm. i'm authentic with it i'm saying hey i'm showing that i'm getting these incredible opportunities but at the same time at the end of the day the, the thing that would make me the most happy is having my mom back that'll never happen so with every happy thing that happens to me there's always a piece of me that is a little broken in a sense and being on social media all day every day and having people say things about me and about my creativity and about my ideas um it's taxing but i think i look at hate as okay these people are talking about me and what i have to say at least they're listening at least i'm being heard um they're participating yeah participating but i think that you have to find a fine line like my team knows after a week of travel i need to decompress for a day um they can tell in my voice in Zoom meetings where my mental health is at. So just surround yourself with people who understand the weight and the pressure of your career and on your mental health, I think is extremely important. And that's not always the case, mm -hmm. but it's not not professional to tell the people around you, look, right. I need a minute. But I think that's so important, but also the where we are with social media right now is that the more honest and truthful, and I don't like the word authentic, so no offense, I know yeah. you used it. I, I like to say accountable, Yeah. You know, because you're being honest. If you're honest about things, it makes you more relatable. So while it's a new thing for older generations to hear someone break that wall and say, oh, well, I'm talking about this, but I don't actually feel great today, that's what TikTok's about. And mm -hmm. I think that is, especially TikTok, but more and more people don't want the fantasy, they want the reality. I say it's like moving from idealism to realism. Yeah, and I think it's breaking generational trauma. Yeah. I mean, I grew up, um, I'm 28, I'm a millennial, and I feel like my parents' generation, um, not only were they not speaking about their issues, they definitely weren't getting help for their issues. So I feel like in my generation, not only were we speaking about our issues, we're seeking help for those things, which are two different taboos that were not spoken like normal in the past. Um, so I think it's really important for me to speak about these things. And honestly, I get the best traction when I'm honest. Um, and it's not all about numbers. I would speak about mental health if the numbers weren't there. But um, I do think it's refreshing too. And when I see other people speak about issues that I'm going through, that is like the biggest like sigh of like relief, like, oh, yes. Like this is exactly who I feel. And I feel like TikTok does that in a way. And the funny memes that we're like, oh my God, we've never had an authentic thought. Like this is so me and the funny ones, but also in like the mental health ones as well. So I think that's why I love t TikTok as well. Um, we, full disclosure, we represent him, but I love Just Me Rod. His content He's one of my is, best friends. Oh, he, I love he's him. amazing. And he's now on LinkedIn and I find it so inspiring to see his take on mm -hmm. work culture integrated into LinkedIn, which is, you know, all about, hey, I just launched this yeah. and I'm guilty of that too. So I, th I think that he's really leading the charge yeah. on a lot of this. And he's like, so there's certain creators that are and like, my nice. yeah, my creator friends. And um, he's one of the people that in person, it's the same, like, yeah. he's just so 
I love him. I, we were in, uh, I, I got to walk around with him at an event and I felt it was better than being with a celebrity because yeah. people really, they wanted to hear from him. They wanted to know what he was thinking. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. It's kind of like watching you walk around here. It's like yes. the people are swarming. All right, so let's, let's play a little bit of a Real Time Robin. Um, okay. I'll call it Real Time Robin. Uh, I'm going to throw out a brand. Let's, let's see oh if gosh. we can talk about it. Okay. And, I, and I'll also participate. So cool. I'll, I'll throw myself in and be brave. Into it. Let's talk about Netflix. Okay. I'm very concerned about this advertising thing that they're doing now because they keep talking about all these that they're going to put ads in and this is a big thing in the industry and I've noticed that in all the marketing and talking about it they're never talking about the audience and they're never talking about who these ads are going to reach who they're targeting people hate ads so I find it fascinating that Netflix is going to go down the route of putting in ads but without at this moment and they may have plans that clearly I'm not privy to why couldn't those ads be creator content? Why do they have to be standard 30 second spots? This is my pet peeve. I I <clears throat> see what you think. Kind of like what you were saying before. It's like maybe this business model and the, and the people in these rooms aren't fully understanding the depth of like, not in a disrespectful way, um, but what <laughs> having creative ads, um, creators ads could do rather than traditional ads. Um, even on podcasts, oh, we're on podcast right now, a lot of times when an ad comes, you just skip, 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 skip. And I feel like you weren't able to skip, 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 skip growing up when you were watching traditional media and having those ads. So it's like, I'm not sure why Netflix isn't kind of growing with the times because they grow with the times in so many different aspects of right. their business. So it's like, why aren't you kind of hopping on this? But if I was with Netflix and we had to do traditional ads, I would make an advertisement about how growing up, watching TV, watching the ads was a part of watching TV. And we didn't complain about it back then. And it almost, I looked forward to watching the ads when I was growing up, because I'd be like, oh, I want that, I want that, I want that. And they could show like the greatest moments um, from growing up when you are all around the TV, like waiting for your new show to come out. Those ads were part of that. So bringing that back, you could almost do like a nostalgic take to it and be like, you didn't complain about it when you were seven. Like maybe like going back in time is better. Or like saying how like we were all so much happier back then without all the crazy things that are happening in the world now, doing a nostalgic take on using traditional ads and playing on that rather than being like, hey, you, ha you haven't had to watch ads for this amount of time, we're just gonna throw this on you now. So I feel like if they had to take some sort of pure approach to like letting people know that we're gonna have traditional ads back in the TV, I mean, back in the uh, streaming space, that they could kind of play it up um, a little bit, but I'm not necessarily looking forward to it, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, we'll I mean, see. Yeah. They're, they're pretty smart over there. Yes. Okay, what do you think about the new, I don't know if you've seen it, have you seen the new Apple Watch campaign? Which one? Where it's all about dark and it's about uh, if you don't have an Apple Watch, you're gonna die. That's basically it, where it's like they have the GPS, if you're getting a car crash, it's a, uh, it's a it notifies emergency mm -hmm. services. Um, I've been reading about it and asking people about it. I find it so fascinating, it's so dark. Yeah. And they've really had to find new ways to get people to spend $250 to buy a watch mm -hmm. in, this, in the economic times that we're in. So they leaned into uh, emergency and prepper mentality and your, you know. Fear almost. Fear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a good motivator. Yeah, definitely. I, see, I, I love dark ads. Because uh, I love ad that ads that make me think and be like, whoa. Um, but maybe using an ad based around fear in this day and age. Um, I, I don't know if it's a smart thing, um, but it could be because everybody's afraid of everything. Like everybody's afraid of everything in the world right now. I'm afraid of everything in the world right now, but maybe twisting it to be softer in the sense of being like buying it for a loved one because it's like the, the only thing that you can do in life is to be prepared um, like for preventative measure, like especially when it comes to like healthcare and like just checking in on yourself and like caring about the ones you loved is like being like, oh, like put your seatbelt on. Um, oh, text me when you get home. Mm -hmm. Those little things to show that you love somebody and it's like an act of showing somebody that you love them. Your love language, yeah, acts your of love, service. Yeah, so maybe like buying an Apple Watch 
to make sure that the person and that your life is safe and they can contact them at all times and they can um, have it on in case of like a car crash or in case of like um, passing out, like all those things that they talk about, doing it from that angle of like making sure your loved, like loved ones are taken care of rather than you're gonna die if you don't have an Apple Watch. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't think they actually said that. That's yeah. me making fun of it, but I love, your, I love your brain twisting around. Yeah. Okay, last one and then and then we'll do our famous uh, round robin, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna it's, I call it a round robin with robin. I need so to, yeah, real time I need round to robin with robin. Off of round robin. I think you, I think you do. <laughs> uh, so there's a, a whole movement right now called the soft life. Mm -hmm. And it's about people, I think post pandemic, nobody wants to hustle mm -hmm. or there's a, a misunderstanding about it. They, they don't want to have stress where they don't have to have stress. It's an extreme yeah. self care. And I, we've noticed a few examples of that. Gucci just came out with a new shoe. Um, that's the don't run. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to stress. You can mm -hmm. just contemplate. Uh, DoorDash has come out with a dash pass for college kids so that they can afford DoorDash so they don't have to leave their dorms and they can use mm -hmm. their time more wisely. Uh, you know, quiet quitting is something that's like soft life. Gonna, yeah. That's a soft life. So if you're a brand and that's something in the zeitgeist right now, does do you think that's something that would, they should be tapping into? Yes and no. Um, I think you have to ask the question of why are consumers feeling like this? And is that going to last, is that going to have longevity? Is it right now that we all need to decompress because the past couple of years has been insane? Yes. <laughs> or maybe tap into the opposite of figuring out why we feel so run down and so tired and kind of asking the why and figuring that out before your next ad campaign instead of just hopping on, well, nobody, everybody's so relaxed, like quiet quitting, all of this, and just hopping on that and be like, why are people feeling like this? And why does my brand relate to that? And what can we do to maybe solve this issue rather than just leaning in on not wanting to hustle and like not doing that? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, you're a, you know what? Actually, I think you're a, you're a business therapist. Thank you. I think I'm going to coin that term. I think you're a business therapist because that is like psychology. Yes. But applied to business. And I, and I think that's a really interesting way of putting it. I, I love that. I, I think we have to get you in and, and go through all these brands and see what, see what Robin's Asking the why. Are. I think, um, Simon said. Cynic, yeah, that, well, yeah. I, I, I always do think too, like a lot of brands are stuck in the 2016 to 2018 influencer era where people weren't understanding why influencers or celebrities were pushing products and it was made to look organic, but like now we know it's not their paid deals. We all know the science right. and the breakdown behind it. And instead of asking yourself, okay, what celebrities, what influencers should we have pushed this product? Why are we pushing the product in general? What is the product story? Let's go back to telling the product story mm -hmm. and intertwining that with the person selling its story instead of just being like, okay, this, this person's gonna sell this amount of things, so like, let's use them. I feel like back in the day, advertisements, they just like had such more of like a storytelling aspect to it and it felt so much deeper and like I connected with those ads rather than just having product placement or having certain people try to push product. Like I always ask the why and I think that's a business therapist in me. Did you, was there an ad as a kid that lit you up that you were like, oh my God, I love that. I have a couple of them. Um, weird, like the Got Milk um, mm -hmm. campaigns. I always think oat milk um, or like almond milk, like they need to do a play on that because obviously we could never do like whole milk that is like so taboo. Um, but. The Got Milk ads were ads that I saw everywhere and I wanted to be in them. Like I like I would okay, if I had a Got Milk ad, this would be the set. This is what I would be doing. And that kind of like pushed my creativity. Um, but then also I grew up in New England. I'm a big sports fan and Don't tell me you're a Patriots fan. <sighs> I'm a Giants fan. Oh, I it's thought okay, we liked you. It's okay, it's okay. okay, fine. All right. Um, but Super Bowl commercials are my number one goal yeah. is to be a part of a Super Bowl commercial. Um, but the Budweiser Super Bowl commercial post 9-11. Um, oh, I just got chills. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That, yep. I think that ad is probably the one that stuck with me the most throughout my whole life. And I was seven, eight years old. And I remember watching the TV and making it, it made me feel something and I cried at like eight years old. And I was like, I don't know these people personally. I don't drink beer. <laughs> um, but this ad has made me feel 
to the point where I cried. And that's what makes me fall in love with advertisements. Um, so definitely like the Budweiser post 9 11 one and then the Got Milk ads for sure. Love it. Okay, so here's our round robin, real time round robin. Okay. Okay, it's, we call it swim, stuff that's doing well. Okay. Sail, stuff that's really killing it, or sink, stuff okay. that just shouldn't happen anymore. So is swim kind of like it's doing so well and it's on the come up and sail is like it's at its peak? Yes. Okay. So a brand, a campaign, a Kardashian moment. I know you, you talk about every Taylor Swift, any of them. What, it could be celebrity, it could be a product. For swim, sail, and sink. I would say, a, I'm, I'm, I I'm want to be like, for sync, it's going to be hard. But I will say sync in general, I even though I am a creator, I kind of want to go back to what I was saying with the 2016, 2018 traditional brand deals, format and script and how they're pushing product. I think that would be sync. Yep. Um, even though it's like not a brand, but like that type of that's okay. advertising, I that think works. is sync because it's, Let's we, go back and record it so that it's it's clear, like you, so we can just have a soundbite. Yeah, because I love that, and that's okay. a great one. It doesn't have to be a person or a specific product; it could be a mindset. Okay, so should I just say sync? It's from the beginning. Yeah. Okay, so my sync would be, as a creator, I feel like it's taboo to say this, but certain creator ads, the 2016, 2018 era of thinking and pushing product with influencers that is not authentic, that has a script. Um, we've all kind of seen how the sausage was made. And I feel like we see through that now. Um, and that's not to say I don't think brands should use creators. I think they should. But to do it in a different way and to kind of go back to what this whole podcast has been about, tapping them to be a part of the creative um, would allow it to swim or sail. Um, swim, I think, would be for a brand, I th um, Chamberlain Coffee mm -hmm. and Emma Chamberlain. I think she is the perfect example of a creator joining the space of selling um, a good, like selling product, mm -hmm. but that is so niche and is so who she is. But people who don't know who she is would still be interested in buying it because of the advertisements, because of what the product looks like, because of what the product tastes like. Love. And I think sale would be. I don't know if this is corny, but my sale would be people like you and brands like you who are hearing me and my story and other people like me and wanting to learn more about my thought process and explaining your thought process and figuring out how we can work together to change the industry and giving people voices, like I like what you are saying before of educating um, and working with Logitech and becoming more robust and diverse and speaking about the issues in the industry and bringing light to them, not in a negative way, but in a way of like, how do we fix this? How do we be a part of the solution? And how do we be a part of change that is very necessarily going to happen, not from a judgmental standpoint or from a standpoint of being like, uh, I don't know, is this, this just a trend? Just being open, being real, asking questions, um, and having your finger on the pulse of what is relevant and what needs to change, I think is gonna be my sale. Well, Dr. Robin. Thank you. Thank you for my business therapy moment. This no has problem. been tre tremendous, and I wanna do more with you. I wanna learn more from you. Me too. And thank you so much for coming and spending time with us today. Thank you, and I think um, time, energy, and effort is the biggest currency in this industry, so for you to even take the time to speak to me is massive and does not go unnoticed, and this is a great way to start the day, so thank you. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed what you've heard and will come along with us as we navigate this journey to the promised land of the creator economy. Make sure to subscribe or follow our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or wherever you like to listen to audio. And of course, we'd love a rating and review if you get the opportunity. Make sure to check out more from Whaler and all things at the intersection of talent networks, brand partnerships, technology, and creativity at whaler.com. And follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. For everything is better with creators, I'm JB Goodfriend. We'll catch you next time.
Everything is Better with Creators is produced by Whaler. Whaler, we power the creator economy. Learn more at whaler.com.